being out here tonight. Just got to know how many men are here tonight. If you're a man here tonight, I just want to hear you say hoorah on three. One, two, three. Hoorah! Yes. I love that. Let me think. Ladies, um, I, I want to see if you're here tonight, too, so I'm going to give you a chance to respond. So on three, I want you to say, uh-huh. Can you get that? One, two, three. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, what I love is the ladies, when I said that, you started looking at each other going, oh, we get to talk now, we get to talk now. I love that. See, guys don't do that. We're simple people. Guys are simple people. And, and, and if, you, if you agree with me on any of these, you feel free to agree in that way. Guys, by saying hoorah, let me hear it one more time. Hoorah! And ladies, you too, one more time. <laughs> okay, now you feel free to respond that way if something hits you, okay? Because guys are different. We're different. Ladies, I saw you walking in tonight. And you talked to each other and you started going on and on and on. See, guys, don't. You met each other. I saw some of you do this. You walk up. And you walked up to another woman. And you went, oh, my gosh, I love your hair. I love your hair. Is that a bob? A, a weave, a cut, a curl? What is that? See, men don't do that. Men don't do that. Most of you ever hear a man say to another man about his hair, do you get a haircut? <laughs> That's it. That's it because we don't have that. And ladies, you speak in code and you don't even know you're doing it. See, men, we just have jeans and khakis. They go with everything. You have categories for your clothes. You start going through each other. Oh my gosh, that looks so good on you. I love that color. You're a spring, aren't you? You are, yeah. Spring. No, it's great. It looks good on you. Those, those colors make you look thinner. Which is code for, I think you're fat. It's just, oh, it's just different. Now, see, guys, we don't have that gene. And we have this honesty gene. When I started dating my wife, this guy, my roommate, I just said, dude, how does this shirt look on me? Do I, does it make me look fat? And he went, shut up. You are fat. Quit blaming the shirts. I was at the gym last week, and there was a buddy of mine there. I hadn't seen him forever. And I'm like, dude, it's so good to see you. Man, you're in great shape. He's like, no, I'm not. I said, no, really, you're in great shape. He's like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, dude, you're in great shape. He's like, well, you don't want to see me naked. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> There's just something wrong there. Now, I, and, and let me tell you how the women speak in code to me. And I think my in-laws are trying to tell me something. My mother-in-law bought me this beautiful shirt for Christmas. Beautiful shirt. I opened it. I'm like, this is beautiful. She goes, it's an extra large. <laughs> I hope it's big enough. <laughs> Code, okay? That's where that is. My wife's grandmother, we went to eat at her house. She fixed way too much food. I'm stuffed. And she goes, get another plate. Please get another plate. And I'm like, I'm stuffed. And she goes, get another plate. So I got one more. I ate it. And I'm like, oh, I'm miserable now. She goes, get another plate. And I'm like, does the term fat and happy mean anything to you? <laughs> she looked at me. She goes, you don't look happy. <laughs> Speaking cold. And ladies, you have clothing that makes no sense. I'll give you my favorite example. Sleeveless turtlenecks. <laughs> what are you thinking? I mean, are you in the closet going, hmm, it's kind of cold, but it might warm up. I mean, is that it? <laughs> Men do not do that. We don't do that. And ladies, it amazes me. You can make a social event out of anything. You can't even go to the bathroom by yourself. You go in groups and herds. You will go to the bathroom. You will sit down next to a total stranger and carry on a conversation. I love those shoes. Where did you get those? I'm out of toilet paper. Can you spare a square? Do not ask how I know that. Hoorah! <laughs> now, in man world, there are certain rules to the bathroom. One is you go by yourself, if at all possible. But then there are certain rules. They're unwritten and unspoken, but they are there. It's in the Atlanta airport, busiest airport in the world. I'm standing there. This guy walked in, obeyed rule one, which is mandatory three stalls down, okay? But then he just broke every other rule. Out of nowhere, I'm standing there, and he goes, so how's it going? <laughs> There's no talking. 
I'm like, good, 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 good. What you been up to lately? And I'm just not comfortable with this. I'm like, nothing, nothing, nothing else. So I go and I look. I get to the sink to wash my hands. As I wash my hands, I look in the mirror. As I look in the mirror, he says, I see all at the same time. He says, yeah, my fly lands in like two. Won't you pick me up on the curb? We'll go grab a bite before the meeting. And I saw in the mirror, he had on one of those Bluetooth things. I am so getting me one of those. I don't even care if you have a phone, if you need one of those. You realize when you wear that, you can walk around in public and just speak your mind. <laughs> that shirt looks ridiculous, and you, I bet you're codependent, aren't you? <laughs> Not you, I'm on the phone. <laughs> And see, men are just simple. We're simple ladies. You give us way too much credit. Uh-huh. Yes. We're too simple. We're way, way simple. And I'll give you my example. My wife leaves town. She goes, hey, I'm going on a girl's trip this weekend. Can you watch the kids? Can you take care of the kids? Yeah. Now, I've discovered that that means something different to a woman. <laughs> Hoorah. Hoorah. Now, here's my definition. Can you take care of the kids? If she comes home and all three of my children are still alive, it's a success. Can I get a hoorah? Hoorah! Yes. Now, here's the problem. She comes home and I'm very proud. The garage door, I hear it. I'm like, look, they're all alive. She walks in, oh, it's so good to see you. Oh, my goodness, I thought about you all weekend. What'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? Where'd you go? What'd you do? And I'm like, they're alive. <laughs> she, she, but well, what'd you do all weekend? I'm like, stuff. I didn't know there was going to be a test. I would have taken notes. She goes, well, what'd you eat? Just tell me you didn't have pizza and hot dogs all weekend. Just tell me you didn't have pizza and hot dogs. I mean, where'd you go? What'd you eat? What'd you eat? You just told me not to tell you. <laughs> it's one of those things that she goes, well, at least they love fruit. Tell me they had some fruit. They have fruit? Did they have fruit? Loops. <laughs> Here's an ability every man has that I know, and I want to hear a hoorah if you agree, and a uh-huh if you agree, and that is an ability every man has. I don't know where it came from, but I have the ability to sit in a room crowded full of people, stare straight at the TV with a remote control, and I can actually sense when somebody's getting interested in the program and change the channel. <laughs> there you go. But there is one. There is one ability that men have. I call it the man superpower. Ladies, you both envy it, and you, you deny it exists all at the same time. And some of you are going, uh-uh, there's nothing, uh-uh. Let me just tell you what it is. It's the ability that every man has to actually think nothing. <laughs> Hoorah! Hoorah! And I, how many of you have ever had this conversation? You're in a car. And you're driving somewhere. So what are you thinking? <laughs> nothing. Well, you can't be thinking nothing. That's not possible. Uh-huh. You can't be thinking nothing. You have to be brain dead to think nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, we have that ability. Now, here's the problem, guys. It's a superpower. And she envies it and she resents you for it because she can't understand it. And here's what she'll do. She will immediately think he can't think nothing. So what he's doing is he's thinking of something. And he, she remembers the phrase her mother used to say. If you can't say something nice... So she will think he's thinking something and it's not nice and it's not nice about her. <laughs> and she will fill in the blank with the worst possible thought. And she will fill in that blank and blame you for thinking it. <laughs> and then begin to punish and convict you for thinking that thought. And the whole time you were thinking... <laughs> do, do you agree? <laughs> That's not right. We're simple people. We're simple. And the things that we should be simple about, we're not. I was in North Carolina on tour. 
these guys came in. They said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, you know, I'm just hanging out. I said, let us take you to lunch. I said, okay. We go to lunch. Now, I don't know. I, I want to hear a quick hoorah if you are a hunter. If you're a hunter, give me a hoorah. Okay, there's a few hunters. Now, most of us, I'm not a hunter, but they sat down. For 90 minutes, they explained hunting. They said, what do you do? I said, I'd like to play golf. I said, we're hunters. I said, cool. I said, I like to play this word duck hunters. I said, well, tell me about duck hunting. Now, I don't know if you're a hunter, but these guys will explain to you. If you live with one, here's how it works. For 90 minutes, they explain this. I'm going to do it in 90 seconds. You get up at some unbelievable hour in the morning. You dress in some sort of foliage. <laughs> you drive for a really long time to sit in a cold, wet bush. <laughs> and you throw out some plastic ducks. And you blow on this amazingly annoying whistle. <laughs> Until something flies by. Or you shoot the guy with the whistle. <laughs> They say, this is fun. And I'm like, really? And after 90 minutes, they said, what do you think of duck hunting? I said, I think you made this way too hard. They said, what do you mean? I said, first, I would sleep in in the morning. I said, well, you can't. I said, no, no. It's not because I'm not a morning person. It's because there's something about grown men dressed like trees wandering in the dark with guns. That's just not right. I said, secondly, I would give ducks credit. We know ducks talk. You've heard ducks. Quack, 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 quack. We know they talk. I think they get together at some point. And one duck gets up on a stump and says, hey, stay away from the walking trees. <laughs> Those exploding branches will mess you up. <laughs> but if I were to duck hunt, here's what I would do. I would go, I would sleep in, I would dress comfortably, I would go to the grocery store. I would buy the cheapest loaf of bread they had. I would go down to a pond where ducks are. You sit under a shade tree. You throw out some bread. Wait maybe a minute. Boom, boom, boom! Shoot as many as you want. There's some useless choices all over the place. It, it, Halloween's coming up. And my kids came up a couple of Halloweens ago going, Dad, can I have this? Look at this, look at this. It was a tube of candy, mini M&Ms. Have you ever seen them? Why? Why did we need that choice? For people eating the regular M&Ms going, oh, dang, I can't finish a whole one. <laughs> I wish they'd make those smaller. Put that in some foil and eat the rest of that later. <laughs> and there's other choices that made no sense to me. No sense to me whatsoever. That one choice, I went to college. First time I went to my big first college football game, I saw this on TV, but for the first time in my life, in real life, guy cheerleaders. Have you ever seen them? And I'm sitting there looking, going, what a bunch of dorks. And then I got up closer, like huge guys. And then I got to meet some of them, found out they're former football players, blew out a knee, now they're college cheerleaders. And I got to thinking, maybe they're not so dumb after all. <laughs> Think about it. They rehab their knee, they come back, now they have a choice. They can wrestle around with fat, sweaty, ugly, stinking guys <laughs> who basically want to cripple them for life. Or you hang out with the cutest girls on campus. You grab them by the behind, hold them over your head. <laughs> Hoorah! <laughs> now, if you ever meet one, you've got to ask them this question. I did. I, my my brother-in-law, former cheerleader. I had friends in school, former cheerleader. And ask them. If you ask them, they'll say the same thing. I asked them this question. What's it like grabbing girls by the behind? What is that like? If you ask them, they will all say the exact same thing. Well, you know, you don't really realize that's what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I can see drinking a Coke going, oh, I thought that was a Pepsi. Okay, I'll buy that. I'm not buying that. Hey, all right, go, all right. Hey, what are you doing up there? 
not like you can go to the grocery store and get in line behind an attractive woman. Ha! Excuse me! I'm a former college cheerleader. Didn't realize I just did that. Life is complicated enough. How many of you are married? Raise your hands if you're married. If you're married, that's great. That's awesome. Love being married. Love watching you guys be married, too. See, I, I knew you're married. You're sitting with your spouse. You got a ring on. I wanted to see how long you've been married, and I can tell by the way you raise your hands. <laughs> Newlyweds always raise their hands and stare at each other. Oh, that's us. That's us. I love you more. I love you more. <laughs> Most of you have been married for a few years, got a couple kids. That's enough to admit it, but not much else. Yeah, I've been there, done that. My favorite are the older couples, though. I'm not going to point them out. But the wife will raise one hand and go, you raise your hand with the other. <laughs> Poor guy's going, what are we voting on? <laughs> but being married is wonderful. It's wonderful. I do, I do have to go agree with my buddy at my, at my groom's room at my wedding. Buddy came up. He's one of my grooms. He goes, dude, they should warn you when you get married. So what are you talking about? He says, they should warn you. What do you mean? He says, they should change the wedding vows to let you know what's ahead. I said, like what? He says, to women, they need to be the same. Do you take him, better or worse, rich or poor, sickness or health, death do you part? I do. To men, they need to read some version of Miranda rights. <laughs> you have the right to remain silent. Because anything you say can and will be misunderstood. <laughs> and it will be used against you. Can I get a hoorah? <laughs> it's just different. It's different. My buddy told me after I've been married for a while, he said, man, when you get married, you never get to do anything you want to do ever again. I've been married 14 years. That's not true. I do whatever I want to do. It's just now I have to ask my wife what it is I want to do. <laughs> Vacuum? Okay. Good thing I asked. Could have sworn I wanted to play golf today. Would have looked like a moron doing this out there. It's worst five words any husband will ever hear. Worst five words. Do you notice anything? different. I've been married 14 years. I have yet to get that right. I started going through the list. Is it, is it your hair? Uh, your nails? Did we have another child? <laughs> Physics don't exist. Physics do not exist in marriage. We have a, we have a king size bed. I had friends warm me. They said, man, she will push you off the bed. Sure enough, I'm on the edge of the bed. Came back to the bed one night after going to the restroom. I stopped at the end and I thought, I'm a genius. I thought, I'm just going to get in on the other side. I fell asleep thinking, I'm brilliant. I will win man of the year. I woke up 30 minutes later about to fall off the other side. She found me. I don't know how. And it's not that I'm not used to sleeping on the edge of a bed. I am. As is every other man I've ever met. Is used to sleeping on the edge of a bed because every man I've ever met has been on a trip with other men at some point in their life and had to share a bed with another man. And you sleep on the edge of that bed. Hoorah. Hoorah. Because every man knows that if you're laying down and touching another man, you start wearing sleeveless turtlenecks. That's the way it happened. <laughs> Not right. Physics don't exist. We have a walk-in closet. Walk-in closet at our house. We have racks on both sides, shelving to the ceiling. I get this much room. That's not the part I don't understand. My wife's clothes are so packed, you can pull hangers out and nothing falls down. That's not the part I don't get. I'll be in there on a Sunday morning going through which pair of khakis I'm going to wear. My wife will walk in behind me, look at this panoramic view of clothes, and she will actually say the phrase, I have nothing to wear. That drives me crazy. 
But there's only one thing worse. Ladies, I want to be very candid with you for a moment. It amazes me how much hair you can lose <laughs> and have any left on your head whatsoever. My wife takes the first shower in the morning. I go to turn on the water. Holy cow. <laughs> There's a small toupee down in the drain. I don't know how you men are, but if I'm brushing my teeth and one falls out, I'm like, hey, don't give up so easy. Can I get a hoorah? Hoorah! Man, that's just not right. But I will say this, I absolutely love being married, and I love being married to my wife. She's brilliant and beautiful. But one of the reasons why I love being married is that she has this condition we call isms. Heather, isms, she mixes up phrases. In my mind, because I, my mind works in pictures, it's just entertaining at times. We talk about a friend that hadn't, hadn't been in work for about six months, and she said he better get his act together, or he's going to be up a tree without a paddle. <laughs> I said, why do you need a paddle in a tree? There's some mutant squirrels I'm not aware of. Or she asked about the shows one time. We had this sold out show up north. She goes, how do you make that happen? I said, well, people really, they just take a flyer and they tell their friends. They just get out and tell their friends. She goes, oh yes, yes. Mouth to mouth, that is the best advertising. <laughs> May not be the best, but it's the most memorable. <laughs> Come here, I want to tell you something. <laughs> Just didn't want you to forget. <laughs> the, the great part is, is that they just happen. And every now and then they just happen, usually once or twice a week. We're in our neighborhood, at the swimming pool. Head of the pool committee standing there talking to my wife. There's people getting in, don't belong. I don't know how they get in. I just don't know. I guess we need to tell them not to come in or maybe a sign. Heather goes, yes, yes, a sign, yes. She goes, I don't know what to put on the sign. Maybe, maybe residents only or guests with residents only. I don't know. Heather goes, no, you be firm, be firm. She goes, like, what? What do I put on there? Oh, I tell you what to put on there. And I'm standing there. And in that moment, I literally thought, <laughs> and I was not disappointed. She said, you just put on there, trespassers will be violated. That's what <laughs> but I started hearing them everywhere. I love that I hear them everywhere. I was at Home Depot. And there's this couple, I'm looking for a particular kind of, of fixture, and, and there's a couple there, and he's trying to explain how to hang a picture to his bride, and she was not happy about it. He says, we've got to have a certain, you've got to use your stud finder, and then you've got to find the stud and mark it, and she's just like, Pfft. and he goes, well, and then once you find the stud, you've got to get an arrow, that's why it's got to be this long, you've got to put it at an angle, and she's like, Pfft. And he goes, is there something wrong? And no, I almost laughed out loud. She goes, I know how to screw a nail. <laughs> Another time I walked by the remodeling area and the husband and wife were standing there. And she was just like, oh no, we're going to do tile everywhere. We're going to get granite on the countertops. Then we want, we want a lot of that, uh, that incest lighting. That's what we want. <laughs> One of the guys with the little orange vest on one time, he's trying to explain a project, and again, I almost laughed out loud. Then I'm walking by, he goes, well, yeah, you can do it that way, but man, you're just gonna open a whole clan of worms. <laughs> what does that look like? I didn't even know worms could be racist. <laughs> oh, look, they're little albino worms. Look at little pointy hats, that's really precious. And then some isms are just dumb. I mean, they're just dumb. It's, I'm, I'm literally outside of the mall one day. Lady goes, "Oh, that'd be such a beautiful sunny day if it wasn't for the clouds." 
and I'd be thin. If it wasn't for this roll of fat right here. Yeah. They're just everywhere. Now, my wife comes by it honestly, because her whole family is eat up with this disease. Went to the beach, family reunion, flew kites, 99 cent kites, last about an hour and a half. I thought, that's pretty good. They started breaking up, but I thought, 99 cents. Me and her brother, my brother-in-law, picking the pieces up, and he goes, wow, I guess, wow, I guess, you, I guess you pay for what you get. <laughs> Otherwise, it's shoplifting. We went to a buffet restaurant. My kids took too much food. They did not eat it all. My mother-in-law looks at them and their plate's half full and she goes, oh my goodness, I guess your eyes are bigger than your head. <laughs> my kids are cartoon characters now? But my favorite is my father. I love my father-in-law, but he's the, he does it and he's belligerent about it. We went to play golf. I want to hear hoorah if you play golf. Hoorah. Okay, you'll get this par five. I hit a great drive. Got about 200 yards of green. I said, how far? He said, about 200, but it's over water. I said, well, I'm going to go for it. He goes, I wouldn't do that. I said, Bri I feel good today. I'm going to give a shot. I wouldn't do that. I said, well, I'm going to try. And he goes, whatever floats your goat. I couldn't help it. I said, would that be a boat? And he turned around and he goes, boats already float. <laughs> I hit it in the water. It was great. But they're all around us. They're all over the place. And, and, and I love this. That Now, my wife does them, and I think in pictures. And here's a great example. She's on the phone one day talking to a friend about her grandfather telling another person about it. She goes, yeah, it doesn't look good. They, they think they, no, they said that, they think they said that he has suggestive heart failure. <laughs> now see, my mind thinks in pictures. And I'm thinking of this poor guy coming into the doctor and the doctor says, yes, come, come and sit down. Um, yeah, I was just uh, looking through your file here. Um, don't know how to tell you this, but uh, nobody likes you. <laughs> um, just be better if you weren't here. I recommend heart failure. It's just a suggestion. It's just wrong. Thank you. I got a buddy, his wife has the same condition. I asked him if he was going. I said, Why aren't you going to lunch with your wife? He goes, No, I'm good. I'm good. So we went to lunch. I said, I thought you were going to have lunch with her. He goes, No. He said, I called her. She goes, No, I've got my doctor's appointment. It's my annual monogram. <laughs> he said, I said, Well, boy, that must hurt. She goes, No, it's not that bad. I said, What letter are you getting this year? Now, the bad part is, is when we hear them and you can't laugh. That's the bad part. We went to visit some friends. He had chest pains, and we went to visit him in the hospital, and she, the wife, walks out right as we walk up, and we're, how's, how's he doing? Is he okay? And she goes, yeah, um, no, he's good, he's good. Um, uh, they ruled out a heart attack. It's not a heart attack, and, um, but they're going to keep him overnight, uh, but he's still in a lot of pain. They're going to run some tests in the morning, but... Um, the pain, but they're, the, the nurse just went in to seduce him, so they're... <laughs> I waited until she looked away and I leaned over to my wife. I said, I don't feel so good myself. <laughs> Can I get a hoorah? We were laughing, walking out of the, through the, the guest room there and the waiting room and the nurse, a nurse stopped us. She goes, what is so funny? And we, I said, I'm sorry, it's rude. We just heard something. She goes, no, no, no. I said, I know it's rude. She goes, no, I'm having a bad day. I want to know what's funny. 
And we told her, and she said, goodness, last week you should have been here. And I said, what happened? She goes, I'm in a room. The guy's got pneumonia. And his wife, she's walking around the room going, no, it's not good. No, it's two or three more days. No, his, his fallopian tubes are all clogged up. And it's just... <laughs> I'm sorry, but if you're a man and your fallopian tubes are clogged up, pneumonia is the least of your problems. Just saying. Oh. But see, we, we all need help. We all have a glitch. We all have a glitch and we all need help. And I tell you, one of the things I love, uh, just as a, as a hobby, I love fortune cookies. I love to get my little fortune cookie because I love fortunes. And I open one up. Now, I travel about 100 dates a year. And I open one one up time, I'm reading, it's like, you will travel to many places. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Got one of my favorites, though. I open it up, it says, your love life will be happy and harmonious. I keep that one on my nightstand. <laughs> my wife starts to act up. I go, hey. <laughs> my fortune. doesn't work. <laughs> My favorite of all time, though, I opened up one time. It says, avoid taking unnecessary gambles. Right under it. Lucky numbers, 17, 14. 15. <laughs> I wish they had reality fortune cookies. They got that one, the one saying that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I wish that was a reality one. What doesn't kill you still hurts a lot. <laughs> I'll buy that. I wish I could slip some in sometime just to see the reaction on people's face. In the days to come, a random dog will bite you. <laughs> Maybe you got some friends like mine. I'd love to slip this one in one time. They click it open. Get some new clothes and haircuts. <laughs> the 80s are over. <laughs> but I wish we had, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but we have a lot of answers to problems that nobody has. I mean, an issues, problems and, that nobody has. I'm driving down the road today on the interstate, and I'm driving by speed limit, so I'm speed limit 55, speed limit 70. That's my favorite. Have you noticed the signs they put out like every fifth sign on the bottom? Minimum speed, 40 miles an hour. Have you seen these? Who are these for? <laughs> Have you ever been in a car with somebody going, hey, you see any cops? <laughs> I'm doing 35, woo! And then they have the one on the other side of the road in the median, do not drive on median. <laughs> Who is in the fast lane going, hey, try the slanted area? <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Last year, bought some firewood, took it home, put it in the fireplace, throwing it away, had a bright orange caution tag on it. I thought, what do you put on a caution? What? I looked, it says, caution, warning. This product may be flammable. <laughs> I don't need that. Empty the garbage can. Put a new liner in it. As I'm pulling the liner out, I noticed writing on the bottom of the liner. I thought, what do you write on the bottom of a liner of a trash can? It was instructions <laughs> on how to use the trash can liner. <laughs> Who is struggling with this? Who's pulling that out going, what do we do now? <laughs> I don't know, throw some garbage at it. <laughs> I gotta show you this one because this is one of my favorites of all time. <coughs> Wife bought a hairdryer. This fell out. And I've saved it for years because I love it. Instructions on how to use the hairdryer. I don't want to be mean, but if you need instructions on how to use a hairdryer, put it down. You don't need to be using it, but look at this, two-sided, small prints. <laughs> With diagrams. 
I, get, I gotta read you my, fa my favorite warning and my favorite instruction. My favorite instruction, how to plug it in. <laughs> if the plug does not fit fully in the outlet, reverse the plug. <laughs> if it still does not fit, contact a qualified electrician. Can you imagine that phone call? Yeah, I need to come out to my house. What seems to be the problem? I can't plug in my hair dryer. <laughs> this is my favorite warning. There are 17 warnings to the use of a hair dryer. I'll show it to you afterwards. It's four words. Never use while sleeping. You know, I'm kind of tired, <laughs> but I really need to dry my hair. I know. <laughs> How'd you get that burn spot on your head? <laughs> I don't need those instructions. I see, there's parts of life I need instructions. When I got married, I wish that would have come with instructions because we're different. We're different. I'll never forget on our honeymoon, we're driving. Now, have you ever been driving and you're not asleep, but you're not awake? Do you know that? That drone of the road, that... As I'm driving, it's at night on I-4 in Orlando, and I, I felt something on my arm. Now, I don't like creepy things. And I look over, and my wife is leaning against the door, so I, I can tell it's not her hair. And then it moved. And I wigged out. And it woke my wife up. She's like, what, what, what? I said, there was something on my arm. She said, what was it? I said, I don't know. She's a little grumpy and a little tired. She says, just chill out. Oh. So I start driving again. Ten minutes later, I was wearing shorts. It crawled up on my leg. <laughs> I lost it. Oh! 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 <laughs> she said, what, what? I said, it was on my leg. She said, what was on your leg? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Has anyone ever looked at you and the look on their face? You can tell what they're thinking. The woman I've just pledged my life to is looking at me like you're the biggest dork I've ever seen. <laughs> just chill out. So now I'm like, I don't care if it eats my head. I'm not going to move. <laughs> we go about 10 minutes when I hear the most blood-curling scream I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Thought we were about to hit a bridge or a cow. I'm like, why, why? She is plastered against the door. There's a little white spider on the seat. And she grabs a piece of paper. She begins to yell at me. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? I said, flick it in the back seat. She said, then we won't know where it is. I said, don't flick it in the back seat. To which she leans over and picks up the paper. The spider runs down the seat, sits right next to her leg. Doing 65 miles an hour in a subcompact car, my wife stands up. <laughs> Behind pressed against the window, begins to yell at me in a voice I have never heard come out of a woman. I'm like, honey, we're on the interstate. I can't just pull over now. I pull into the circle, K. Okay. And I said, okay, you can get out now. She's like, no, you come open my door. So I get out. And as I got out of the car, I'm walking around the back corner. And there's three dudes with Slurpees looking at my wife's behind, pushed against the window. <laughs> 
I'm like, there's, there's the bug in the car. And one of the guys said, I'm a former college cheerleader if you need help with that. <laughs> yeah. wow. You know what? Here we are now. That was my honeymoon, and now we're 14 years later, three kids later. And I don't know, moms, what, tell me if you agree with this, okay? With each child, do you feel like your mental capacity just shrinks? Uh huh, yes. And I see this because I see the isms in moms all the time. And, and you can just hear moms with them as they go through this. I saw this one mom, she's yelling at her daughter, she says, don't you look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> moms, do you understand what that means? Have you said that? I love this, we were in a restaurant, this other mom, she was just, like, she was talking to her child, he's kind of all over the place and eating and yelling and singing and eating, and she goes, stop chewing with your mouth full. <laughs> I don't so mind the chewing as I do the talking. Well, it's full, I get that. Another mother trying to get her son, put your hat on, it's not, it's not cold, mom, I just wanna go outside, put your hat on, well, at least take it with you. He goes, but I don't want to. She goes, better safe than stupid. <laughs> Can't really argue with that. And see, moms are so busy, they miss just the smallest little details. This little girl came home from school, she was teaching her mother some of the sign language she learned. Mom, look at this. You know what this is? She tells me, my daughter taught me some sign language. She goes, you know what this is? You know what this is? It's I love you for blind people. <laughs> How does that work? Hey, pfft, oh, oh. I love you too. Oh. I'm blind, but it still hurts. Come here, let me love you back. But see, moms, moms are just that way. I love moms. I love moms. You can trust a mom. You can trust a mom because moms are trustworthy. And you've got to be careful who you trust. And I learned this at a very young age because in life we need something we can trust. I learned at three years old, you've got to be careful who you trust. I used to ride my tricycle across the street to the neighbor's house. Three years old, I'd sit at the top of this huge hill and I'd watch the big kids ride their bikes down the hill and I'd just be sitting there, wow. One day the big kids came up on their bikes. Shh. What are you doing? <laughs> um, I'm watching right the hill. <laughs> and she, you know what would be cool? Is if you rode your tricycle down the hill. <laughs> no. I said, what are you, chicken? Are you not a man? And I'm sitting there, um, I'm, I'm, I'm four years old. I said, come on, man, do it. We'll be here. Trust me. <laughs> so I took my tricycle. And I went over the edge. Halfway down that hill, I was doing 114 miles an hour. <laughs> do you remember tricycles? Do you remember how the wheels and the pedals are connected? <laughs> I'm like, oh. I had two thoughts in my little three-year-old brain. My first thought was, I have no shoes on. I thought, I cannot put my feet on the ground. My second thought was, I'll just put my feet on the pedals and slow it down. <laughs> you put your, pedal, your feet on the pedals of a tricycle doing 114 miles an hour. Those pedals stop. Not the rest of the tricycle, it keeps going. I went over the handlebars. I went the last 10 feet on my face. I know it hurt me too. <laughs> Have you ever cried so loud you cannot open your eyes and you make no noise? Do you know that like that? <laughs> and as I'm trying to catch my breath, I reach up, I touch my lip. The bottom row of my teeth had come out below my lip through the skin. I know it hurt me too. <laughs> And I said, as soon as I catch my breath, as soon as I open my eyes, they will come and help me. I got my eyes open, and they were gone. gone. <laughs> Careful who you trust. Three years later, they built a treehouse. <laughs> I climbed up the treehouse. 30 feet off the ground, they said, you got to be initiated. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> said, you got to grab a limb from the other tree and ride it to the ground. 
really? So I grabbed it. I launched into the expanse, approaching Mach 2. I thought, this is going to work. And then something reminded me that tree branches are connected to tree trunks. And I looked up. I moved my face. Snapped my collarbone in half. I know it hurt me too. <laughs> and I laid at the bottom of that tree. <laughs> I got my eyes open and they were gone. You gotta be careful who you trust. And I don't know where you go for trust. There's a lot of things in our world that are confusing in the midst of trust. I thought church, I could trust the pastor. Pastors trust church. Churches are even confusing sometimes. I was in Palatka, Florida. This very well-meaning church came on the radio. Come to our church. We're ratified. We're sanctified. We're justified. And I was just like, huh? And then they actually said this. Come to our church. We believe in sharing tongues. I don't know if or where you go to church. When I go to church, I don't want to share my tongue with anybody. This bizarre mental picture of the ushers handing out bulletins. Hi, welcome to our service. <laughs> I wanted so badly to call that church and just go, hey, I got a great idea for your marquee out front. Please brush and floss before all service. <laughs> now, I don't know if you go to church or not, but let me just tell you, it is, a, it is like an ism cesspool, especially at the end of a sermon. Like the end of the sermon, pastors, they just start shooting off the top of their head. Let that one sink in. Um, I actually heard a pastor say that one time. He said, hey, I'm just, I'm just going to shoot off the top of my head. <laughs> Do we get to go home after that? Or how does that work? <laughs> I heard another pastor go, let me just tell you, that dog don't fly. <laughs> well, what dog does fly? And they're all over the place. And they say, my favorite one, though, this pastor, very emphatic, he goes, I just want to tell you, there's one thing. There is one thing I cannot stand. One thing I hate. Stupidity and ignorance. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I went up to him after and I said, Pastor, I can totally understand. There's two things I hate. People that can't count. You know, there's, there's one other, I heard this one pastor say one time, he says, no, I don't want to stick my tongue in my mouth. <laughs> well, where do you want to stick it? <laughs> don't answer that. <laughs> but there's a church in Florida you need to check out. I wish I could meet Jesus face to face sometime, but I don't know if you read the Bible or not, but he was funny. And there's this one cool passage where I really wish I was there. He's got like a pop quiz for his disciples. And if you've never heard Jesus funny, you got to check it out sometime. He's like, okay, pop quiz. And he actually asked the question, if your son asks you for a loaf of bread, do you give him a loaf of bread or a rock? <laughs> She brings the disciples, the loaf of bread, the loaf of bread, very good. <laughs> I know he's being funny because he didn't stop. He goes, if your son asks you for a fish, do you give him a fish or a poisonous snake? <laughs> now you can hear the religious ones in the back going, you know, if you cook snake right, it kind of tastes like chicken. <laughs> I mean, that was Jesus. He was just awesome. He was just like, hey, well, if you being evil compared to a perfect loving God know how to give what's good, how much more does God long to give us everything good? He longs to give us everything good. And it, this is, okay, he wants to give us good, and how do I trust? And, and God calls himself like Father. That's what he refers to him all the time. And I learned a lot from my dad. One time specifically, I remember, how many of you have ever seen Pee Wee football? Have you seen that? Oh, it's the best. If you have it, you got to go. I mean, the pads are bigger than the kids are. They just get in little wads and boom, they fall over. It's awesome. 
I'll never forget two games in particular. I played for the 65-pound Smyrna Jets. I was a middle linebacker. And I'll never forget two weeks. First week, we're winning. We're winning by five touchdowns. There's less than two minutes left. And the other team runs a reverse. The guy's gone, and we're running after him. And I remember vividly the guys on my team slow down. And I saw the scoreboard in front. It's under two minutes. We're up by five touchdowns. So I slowed down and quit too. He scored. We got the ball, ran the, ran the clock out, and we won by four touchdowns. The coaches said, great job. Then I walked up the hill next to the field where my dad always sat. Put my pads in the trunk, sit in the seat. My dad starts the car. We begin to go home, and he always said the same thing. Hey, you played a great game. And I would tell him about the game like he wasn't even there. I'm like, yeah, I got four tackles and two sacks and one by four touchdowns. Woo! And he goes, yeah, that was great. He says, but do you remember the last play of the game? And I thought, I go, oh, yeah, they ran in reverse, and he was gone. It was okay. We scored. The coach didn't say anything. It was okay, because we won by four touchdowns. It was all right. And he says, yeah, you know what? It is okay. And he says, but you're my son. And he says, you never give up. He says, you don't know what could have happened. He could have stumbled and tripped. He could have fumbled, or you need to be there to make the play. You just never give up. Remember that. Okay. We parked, and he said, go tell your mom about the game. I ran inside, Mom, Mom, I got four tackles and two sacks. We won by four tackles. Said, Woo! The next week, I will never forget. The next week, it was raining, and it was cold, and we were losing by four touchdowns, and I was miserable. Less than a minute to go, all our quarterback had to do is take the snap, take a knee, and we get to go home. He fumbles the snap, and we got to go on the field for one more play. And I'm sitting there, and the rain is dripping off my helmet. They ran a sweep to the wide side, and pew, the guy was gone. And I remembered in slow motion, I'm chasing through the mud, running after this guy. And I notice and remember in my mind, the other guys on my team slow down. And I notice the clock ticking down. I notice the coaches on the sideline dropping their clipboards and turning around. And I remember in that little white helmet with green stickers, a little voice that just said, you. And I took off. I ran faster than I've ever run in my life. I closed the gap from 20 yards to 15, and from 15 to 10, and from 10 to 5, and from 5, I was right there with his jersey in my fingertips, and this would be such a cool story if I actually caught the guy. <laughs> and I remember the horn blowing. And the referee's throwing up their hands, the other team running on the field, and I remember standing there in this rain. And I remember thinking, it didn't work. And I remember being mad. And then I remember being embarrassed. And then I remember just being just bitter. And I remember walking up that hill next to the field and slamming my pads in the trunk, sliding into the bench, final seats of our Plymouth Valiant. <laughs> And I remember sitting there with my chin down, my lip out. Tell me never give up. I was just mad. My dad got in, he started the car, we began to go, and I didn't look up, I'm mad. He said the same thing he always did. Hey, you played a great game. And I remember going, were you at the same game I was at? He said, yes. I said, we were the green team. I said, I know. And I said, we lost. He says, that doesn't matter. I said, it does matter. He says, do you remember the last play of the game? Wrong question. <laughs> I said, yes, I remember the last play of the game. He didn't stumble, he didn't trip, he didn't fumble, he lost my five touchdowns. My dad got real quiet. You don't raise your voice to my dad. So I tucked my head back down and I got, great. We got beat, now I get beat. This is great. <laughs> He didn't say anything. And I looked out of the corner of my eye, and I noticed he was smiling. He says, that doesn't matter. I said, it does matter. He says, yes, but that's not what's most important. He said, what's most important is when everybody else quit, you didn't give up. And I didn't understand what he meant. He said, I don't know if I've been more proud of you than right now, because when everybody else quit, you didn't give up. You gave your best. And I didn't understand that. And then I looked out the windows, and I noticed we weren't going home. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to McDonald's. <laughs> really? 
Now, you got to understand, this was a time when there wasn't a ton of restaurants, and we never got to go out. And the few times we did, normal at McDonald's would be like, well, McDonald's, you want a small burger, small fry, you want a Coke or a Sprite? Can I have a Coke? Small Sprite. <laughs> that was the norm. This time, however, we walked in, and the girl goes, welcome to McDonald's, can I take your order? My dad didn't say anything, and I thought he's going deaf, but that's okay. <laughs> We're at McDonald's. She leaned forward, can I take your order, please? He did something he'd never done. He put his hand on my back. He said, go ahead. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he pointed to a menu that has not changed in 70 years. <laughs> he said, anything you want. Anything? No. I want a Big Mac. <laughs> he said, a Big Mac. I said, I want two. <laughs> he said, two. I said, I want a large chocolate shake, large fry, and a large Coke. I had a mountain of food in front of me. I had a Big Mac in each hand going, ah, ah, ah. I didn't give up. Nah, ah. I ate every bit of it. I had a bloated stomach. I've never been so miserable and so happy at the same time. But I learned that day, you know what? Trust is not easy. Is it popular? No. Is it easy? No. Is there immediate results? No. But there is McDonald's. <laughs> but see, there are, who are we going to trust? How are we going to trust this? I, I, I learned this idea of trust one trip I took. I love to fly. And because of my job, I fly all over the country. I'm sitting in the plane, and I had the window seat. I love the window seat. And I'm sitting in the window seat, and I didn't know I was praying, but it turns out when you just kind of think and talk to God, that's called prayer. And I'm sitting there going, God, I would just... You know, it's all the way to San Francisco. It would be great if this middle seat was empty. And that's what I was thinking. And I know God listens, and I know he's got a sense of humor. Because I'm sitting there going, it would just be great if this seat were empty. I didn't no more have that thought. They came up, ladies and gentlemen, it's a full flight today, so make sure you're in your right seat. I'm like, really? <laughs> okay, a little girl, a small girl, if she could sit here. The last guy through the door was a door, Okay. <laughs> This guy was going to San Francisco for a tryout with the 49ers. He was a lineman. Now, if you don't follow football, this guy was minimum 6'3", minimum 300 pounds. When he sat in the middle seat, the metal armrest bent out. He exhaled. Oh, and I was, this is going to be a great flight. He's like, I'm really sorry. And I'm like, you're big. What are you going to do? You know, just, He said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't I lean forward, you lean back, and then we'll switch. So the whole flight, we're just doing this. <laughs> and it was so awesome. And then we started our descent into San Francisco. We made it the whole way, and they came on the intercom. They said, ladies and gentlemen, we're finding our final descent into San Francisco Bay Area. Please put your trade tables in full black and open to Simpson. And I'm just like, what? Now, quick aside. I'll come back. Why? Why do the tray tables and the seat backs need to be in the full up and right position? Really, this much? Well, well, that's going to make a difference. <laughs> and the tray tables. Really, I asked the flight attendant, I said, what's up with the tray tables? She goes, well, it's in case of emergency evacuation, they have to be up. I'm sorry, but if there's an emergency and we have to evacuate, I'm not going to be going, oh my gosh, oh, I can't get out. <laughs> the tray table's down. Help! I'm trapped! I'm just saying. So, they say that, and so we get out there and we start our way down. I'm looking out the window. I love the window seat, and there's this beautiful bay with these little white specks of sailboats and the beautiful cliffs, and I'm just like, oh, that's awesome. But we just kept going down, and I'm looking, and there's the cliffs, and there's the bay, and the cliffs and the bay. And we're just going down, and everything in my body, we got to about 1,000 feet. I wanted to ring the flight attendant and go, hey, um, yeah, I was just noticing out my window here. Um, beautiful bay and the cliffs and stuff. I was just thinking probably one of the most important parts of the word landing is land. <laughs> and it's over there. You wouldn't mind scurry up telepilots. Turn. <laughs> Great. But I just sat there. I didn't say anything. And then we start our way down. 
And we got down to under 1,000 feet, 800 feet, 700 feet, 600 feet. I'm like, ah. And we just keep going down over the bay. I am, we get under 200 feet, and I'm looking out going, oh, I fly all the time. I am physically nervous at this point. It's just going, ah. And the, the only thing in my mind is going, ring the flight attendant, jump up, run up, tell the idiots, turn. The land's over there. <laughs> I'm looking out the window, and I'm just thinking, we're dead. We're dead. I'm seeing people on sailboats waving to us as we're going down. <laughs> The only thought going through my brain is your seat cushion can be used as a flotation device. <laughs> I'm just like, ah! We get under 100 feet, I'm like, we're dead. Water, dead, dead, dead. 80, 70, <laughs> Out of nowhere, a runway appeared. And within 10 seconds, we're on the ground. I'm like, ah! <laughs> Had a little different prayer at that point. I said, God, I hope you enjoyed that. Because <laughs> I have to change my pants now. And the thought came to my mind, well, why didn't you get up? Why didn't you run up? Why didn't you beat on the door? Because I trusted. I trusted United Airlines does not hire guys off the street with will work for food signs. <laughs> well, fly an airplane, it's really fun. <laughs> well, don't do it. I trusted my friends who are pilots. They carry that case with them, and they have an approach, but most of all, I trusted they had the front window, and they were going to get us there. And, and what I'm learning is, is trust is, you know what, sometimes the best we got is a side view. I, I want to tell you a quick part of what I'm learning about trust, just, just to really get that to the core. I, I know that intellectually, that God really does have the front view, and, and He gets it. I get that part. But a couple years ago, I learned it at a different level. I just want to share it with you real quick. April 27th of 2007, the whole world changed. I was in Colorado Springs on tour. I get a phone call from my wife, Heather, and she goes, hey, I'm going to take Kennedy to the doctor. She's still complaining about her knees. She goes to the doctor, then goes and gets an x-ray. They call her at the x-ray to go to another doctor, to a specialist. And by the end of the day, I walk off stage. I call home and said, hey, how did it turn out? She's crying. And I was like, whoa, what's wrong? And I heard three words that no parent should ever have to hear. She said, Kennedy has cancer. My three-year-old daughter. And my whole body went numb. And I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget where I was. I, I went to the airport. There wasn't a flight. I rented a car. I drove to Denver. I took the red eye. I came home. And I went to Children's Hospital, and I saw my daughter laying in a bed there. And my whole world changed. I'll never forget those first several weeks. The first eight months of chemo is intensive, where they go every week. And then if any complications, you have to go to the emergency room. And the one part I want to share with you tonight that just really was a radical change in my understanding of trust. In 10 days, I was at the hospital eight times. I was averaging about two hours of sleep a night. I was physically, emotionally, and mentally drained. And I'll never forget, my daughter had a temperature again due to the side effects of the chemo. And I remember scooping her up three in the morning, putting her in the back seat, and driving to the hospital. And I was having one of those thought prayers, just in my mind, just going, Discussing, not in a happy, flowery prayer kind of way. Really? Really? What do you want? God, what do you want? You want to hear me pray again that my daughter would be better? Is that what you want? And I'm just in my mind angry and bitter and just saying, what? What do you want? Why won't you give us a break? And as I'm thinking that, I hear my daughter begin to cry in the back seat. And I reach back and I grab her hand. I'm like, honey, what's wrong? What's wrong? She goes, I don't want to go there. Daddy, I want to go home. And I was just like, it's okay, baby. It's okay. Because she knows what's going to happen. We're going to get there. She has a port in her chest, and they're going to stick a needle in her port, and they're going to put medicine in there, and they're going to rule out all kinds of stuff. And she goes, Daddy, I don't want to go there. I want to go home. And I just had this understanding. How do I explain to her? How do you explain to a three-year-old? We have to do this. See, there could be complications. And we have to do this because if we do this, you have an 85 or 90% chance of remission with no reoccurrence. But if we don't, you have about a 20 to 15% chance. We have to do this. How do you explain that to a three-year-old? You can't. You can't. And as I held her hand, I said, honey, I'm right here. And I had the realization the one person that she trusted was taking her to the one place she did not want to go. And in that moment, I just thought, I get it. 
I literally I prayed. I said, God, I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to understand it. And there was a verse that came to my mind. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on what you understand. And I'm like, I get it. I can no more explain to her why we're having to go through this than I'm going to understand why we're having to go through this. And I said, but all I got is trust. And I'm so glad I can trust something bigger than me. And I began to learn about that. And as we went through this, I learned some incredible lessons. And, and there's one word. I love to encourage people. This is my livelihood. This is my life. I love to make people laugh. I love to encourage people. I remember coming back from the hospital after two weeks, and I'm learning this at a new level. One of my son's friends from school's dad owns a landscaping company. He drove up, parked on the curb at our house. I'm walking to the mailbox. We haven't been there for two weeks. He got out of his truck and he came around. I'll call him Royce because that's his name. So <laughs> Royce. Royce came over. He goes, hey, man, I'm so sorry to hear about your daughter. I just want you to know we're praying for you. And I was like, thanks, Royce. I said, I appreciate it. He goes, I just want you to know we're, we're in this area all summer. And I just want you to know we're going to take care of your yard all summer. And I said, Royce, I said, man, I appreciate that. You don't have to do that. I said, if you could do it one time, though, that'd be great. And he's like, no, we're going to do it all summer. I said, well, you know what? If you could just do it like twice, like this week and maybe next week, because I, I, we're trying to figure this whole thing out. And he's just like, yeah, um, you're not getting this. Uh, we're doing it all summer. And I was like, oh, because he took this word. And this one word has changed my life. It's my best friend and I that sat down at lunch one day. And we came up with this idea. He said, what do you want? I said, what do you mean? He says, what do you want? What can I do? I got to do something. What do you want? What can I do? I got to do something. And I said, John, for the next seven months, I've got to go to intensive, which means every Monday I have to take my daughter out of bed at about five something in the morning, put her in the back of the car and drive her to the hospital. Every Monday, I'm going to go through triage and then we're going to go into the, to the room where they're going to sedate her. They're going to put a needle in her chest. They're going to do a spinal tap on my daughter. And they're going to do chemo through her port. And I said, I have to hold her down. And that breaks my heart. I said, what do I want? I said, I know God is timeless and he knows all, but here's what I want. I want every Monday, every Monday, I want to know that when I'm going to there, there are people praying for my daughter during that time. That's what I want. And he said, done. And he came up with this idea. These little bracelets, it just says, I pray for KGK. That's my daughter's initials. And he had some made. And he handed them out. And he gave them out to some more people and had some more made and handed them out. And for those seven months, for those seven months, this is one of the single greatest encouragements of my life. I will never forget it. Every Monday morning, over 3,000 people wore these bracelets and prayed for my daughter. I, I can't put into words how cool that is. It's that word. It was my neighbor who set up a computer site for us to be able to communicate with people. Unbelievable. It's that word. It's that word that one of our neighbors... Now, I, I didn't tell you this. That year was our year of Job. Have you ever had a year like that? Where nothing goes right? Both our cars broke down. Both our computers, my home and work, crashed. I got my, home, my computer for work back. I turned it on. There's nothing there. I called and said, hey, where's my files? They're like, did you want to save those? I lost 12 years of work in one day. Unbelievable. Our refrigerator burned down. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that? It burned down. My son said, Dad, I think the, there's sparks. <laughs> and we looked out, there's fire coming out from our... <laughs> they came and replaced our refrigerator. I said, have you ever had one burn down? They're like, never heard of it. <laughs> A refrigerator, our little dog, we got a dog two years old when we were first married. He was 14 and he passed away. And I'm just like, what else is going to go wrong? It's our year of Job. And in the middle of that year, my wife was playing tennis one day and Kennedy with her little bald head went over to the tennis courts and one of our neighbors had a little puppy. And Kennedy's holding the puppy. And she goes, this is Daisy. And she's petting the puppy and the little puppy's running around. The cutest thing you ever saw. And we... I, actually used Daisy. One night, Kennedy did not want to take her medicine. She was just like, no, I don't like it. And I'm like, I know, baby, but you got to take it. She goes, I don't want to. And I don't know why I said it. I just said, hey, if you'll take your medicine, we'll go play with Daisy for a minute. And she just went. 
They gave her medicine. Well, now I'm in a little bit of a dilemma because now I've got to take her to see Daisy. It's a little awkward to go to your neighbor's house at 7.30 at night and go, hey, can, um, can your dog play for a minute? <laughs> she took her medicine. But then Mary did something amazingly cool. Mary is Daisy's owner. She called a couple breeders, and a breeder called us and said, hey, I read about your daughter in the paper, and I want to give her a pug puppy. And he drove two hours one day to drop off this pug puppy because he said, hey, when can I deliver it? And Heather said, well, Tuesday's good. And then, well, Monday would be better, but Ken's out of town, but Tuesday's fine. And he said, why Monday? Well, that's Kennedy's birthday. He said, I'm bringing her. He brought the cage, the dog, and everything. And if you could see her with this, this puppy, Skittles the pug. <laughs> Skittles makes everything better. And she has Skittles because somebody took this word. And I learned that word very, very well through this process. The word is simply this, initiative. It's initiative. The number of people that took initiative to just make our world bearable was unbelievable. I even learned it to the point of saying, you know what, I, I've got to do something. And when Kennedy lost the last little bit of her hair, I, I came home and she was just smiling ear to ear, these beautiful, beautiful blue eyes. I said, Kennedy, I love your hair. And she rubbed her head and I said, I want your haircut. She said, okay. I said, I want you to give it to me. She said, okay. We sat on the front porch and for about an hour, she just took the razor and bzz, 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 bzz. You haven't lived till you have a four-year-old give you a haircut, okay? I'm just saying. My wife came out halfway through it. She said, oh, goodness. She said, you look like you have mange. And she goes, you're going to let me fix that. I said, oh, no, it's going. It's all going. That night, we laid down to read books. I bicked my head. And we laid down with the books. And Kennedy could not pay attention. She just kept rubbing her head against mine going, Daddy, we're bald buddies. <laughs> See, I wanted her to know you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not going through this alone. See, that's what initiative does. It just says, hey, I'm here, and we're going through this together. And I am so thankful for what I've learned from that. Kennedy is doing wonderful. We're now about four months past the end of her chemo. She has a great prognosis. But I'll never change what I learned through this process. That idea of taking initiative and taking the time to say, hey, there's something more important than me. And I want you to be able to trust. And that initiative is something that changed my life. I want to leave you the mental picture of what that means tonight. That, that idea of initiative. A buddy of mine, after one Sunday, he said, hey, what are you doing after church? I said, nothing. And he goes, hey, I got tickets to the Falcons game. You want to go? And I'm like, yeah. So we buzzed down. I'd never been, at that point, never been to the Georgia Dome. How many of you have ever been to the Georgia Dome? Raise your hand. Oh, yes, you'll get this. We had great seats. We were in the fifth row from the roof. <laughs> My other friend was like, which team are we? I said, we're the little red and silver dots. Now, when you sit up that high after the game, I didn't know this existed, but you can go down those huge ramps that we walked up and you can walk down them and they spiral around and around and around. By the time you get to the bottom, you have vertigo. <laughs> but there's a choice. On each end of the Georgia Dome, there's an express escalator. It goes from the top level all the way to the street level. And the line wasn't long and my buddy says, hey, come over here real quick. So we got on it and we're like, oh, man, this is awesome. And we started going, it's like 100 yards long, and we're like, oh, this is great. Only problem was, halfway down, it broke. But then we stood there. And we stood there. I began to lean over, like, why are we just standing here? And I couldn't see because everybody else was leaning over. Why are we just standing here? We stood there two and a half, almost three full minutes, stranded on this escalator. <laughs> Finally, some guy in the back, out of frustration, I wish it was me, just screamed at everybody, Walk! Just walk! And we all started walking down here. I wish I could have seen the guy on the front. Oh, darn, and I was almost there, too. I 
they fix this soon, I gotta get home. I'm gonna eat the rest of this M&M. You guys have been great tonight. Thank you very much. God bless you, good night. doesn't work. You gotta laugh and it's gotta be going back and forth and punch your neighbor and holy cow, that was awesome. And I'm gonna do the end of that now that you know what the setup is. Two seconds. Okay. My forehead. My forehead is bigger than it used to be. It takes more. Hoorah! <laughs> Never heard this bit before. Roll, it's gonna be so funny. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. This way. Right. I have a piece of hair on my back. Get off. Like a uh, real hair? A long blonde hair. Thanks for pointing that out. That was great. <laughs> Hoorah! Okay. I'm Mike Tyson. The last fight he had. I don't know if you saw this or not. The interview afterwards. Mike, you can try to make a comeback? No. Hey, and I can't do Mike Tyson's voice. I so wish I could. He's just like, no, I'm not. I just want to retire and fade into Bolivia. <laughs> I'm willing to bet my insurance that he doesn't even know where Bolivia is. And uh, that was really funny, and I'm gonna go from there. So, uh, why are you laughing? That was, that was funny. That really was funny. Is it still there? Is there a hair on my back? Kelly, are you back there? Could you come out and check, please? Hairy back? Yeah. <laughs> okay, hang on one second. I wanted so badly, so badly to just call that church and go, hey. You hear that too, right? Is it dying or? <laughs> it's a new Star Wars image there. And then I'll give you instructions on walking out and I'm gonna definitely be hanging out, especially for students. We just lost the camera. Somebody steal it? <laughs> How long was the second set ballpark? Eight hours and 15 Roughly. <laughs> okay, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do this. So, here we go, ready? Take two. <laughs>